Okay, shall we, uh, shall we just look to the Lord in prayer? Let's, uh, even as we do so, let's thank Him. Maybe there's um, one thing, many things that we are thankful for, uh, that we are grateful for. So just look to the Lord and say, oh God, God, we just be specific and say, Lord, I'm thankful for this. I'm grateful for this. I'm thankful that you did this. Thankful that you are being this in my life. Or uh, you promised that you would lead, you would do, do this for me. And so, you know, in expectation and faith, just go ahead and just thank the Lord. Let's spend some time just doing that. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Lord. Father, we, we just want to thank you this morning that um, that you called us to be and you've made us to be new creations and um, in your precious blood. Father, we thank you that, God, this is something that God, we did not think, we did not design, but something that you designed, Lord, that we should be new creations, God, um, and and purely a work of your spirit and the work of your eternal word, Lord, that we were, Lord, purchased, O oh God, by this incorruptible word, God, and uh, born again by the incorruptible, un incorruptible word and by the work of your spirit. So we thank you, Master. Thank you this morning, Lord, for this privilege. Thank you for this new identity, God. We thank you for this, um, Lord, uh, for this closeness, for this relationship that we have with you, Master. Yes, Lord, we thank you that you've uh, called us to come to the Holy of Holies, Lord, boldly, not with hesitation, not withholding anything, but you've called us, O oh God, to come boldly to your throne, O oh God, to where you are, to where you are seated, Lord, um, in unapproachable light, O oh God, but you've called us to approach with boldness. So, God, we thank you for the way that you've made for us, Master. We thank you for who you are to us, Lord, our eternal God and Savior. Yes, Master, we thank you and we commit, Lord, this day into your mighty hands, God. We pray that you'll continue to, Lord, speak to us, lead us, Lord, and teach us, Father God, line upon line, instruct us, O oh God, precept upon precept. And Lord, we pray that um, we'll be edified, God, and um, Lord, prepared and fully prepared, Lord, for all that you have for us in the coming days. We thank you. We give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' matchless name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Fine. Okay, so um, just a quick recap of last class. Last class we looked at um, um, some of the tabernacles. We looked at um, what uh, Moses built, what David built, and also some lessons that we learned from that, right? So uh, from 1 Chronicles, uh, I think 16, we read about how the tabernacle came into being, David's tabernacle. We also looked at in detail about uh, the tabernacle that uh, that Moses built, what all it has, uh, what it has, and what it signifies. And it's amazing that God, with so much of uh, foresight and, and knowledge, would design something, would give the design for something, you know, uh, like that, which uh, which actually signified um, the cross, right, the sacrifice on the cross, and our relationship with the Lord and our preparation Lord, to meet with God. So it was actually a pathway that we saw. And we see that everything changed in uh, in the tabernacle that David built, right? Um, everything in the sense, you know, again, it is it is about God. It is about uh, um, the holiness unto him, etc. But the, there was, we see several things uh, which are added on Right, um, music and song and so on, which are added on, and um, and we see that happening. Right, I think last class we ended with looking at the kind of team, a kind of people that David put together, or David said, okay, these are the kind of people. This is how they will be uh, when they are when they are going to serve in the tabernacle. Okay, and uh, we just call if we can call it David's um, you know worship team. Um, you know, we, we we read some things about that, right? So, um, so let's let's just uh, quickly recap that again. You know, we looked at one Chronicles um, twenty five verses one to ten, which talks about this, right? So the first thing that we see that we that we saw was that right there in verse one, he says, 
um, David and the captains of the army separated for the service, service in the tabernacle. So we see that this whole thing being a service, right? The whole worship that was happening in the tabernacle, it is it was a service unto God, right? Something that you minister to Him, that you serve Him. Um, so, and people were separated, which means consecrated for this service because it was something that was unto God, which is holiness unto God. And um, uh, it was an act of, um, out from, from a place of holiness, from a place of consecration. Right? So uh, we see that. So th this is something um, important, again, that it cannot be compromise, but it has to be a life of consecration you know, when it comes to the bigger picture of worship ministry or ministering in worship. Right? It cannot be a life of compromise. Just like, I mean, it's it's basic for the life of a believer, but we see things specifically here that it cannot be a life of compromise, but it has to be a life of uh, consecration. Right, so so we see that. Okay. Then the second thing that we see is that it was a ministry which involved prophecy. Uh, we see in verse three, who prophesied with the harp to give thanks and to praise the Lord. It lists down the names of the people, and this is what they did. It was a service. They prophesied, and um, again, verse one itself, we see the same thing that they would prophesy. Um, with harps, stringed instruments, and cymbals. And uh, so we, we see that. So it was a ministry. It was a ministry which involved prophesying. So when we say prophesying, um, what comes to your mind? Prophesying. I know we we finished prophesying, uh, understanding prophetic, right? Uh, that course. And so what what is it that comes to your mind when we say, OK, so it was a ministry which involved prophesying with music. Um, prophesying to build up people, okay. So that is in connection with people, yeah. Okay. Sorry? Uh, sorry, what? God's heart? Mm -hmm. Revealing God's heart, yeah, okay. Revealing, yeah. So you receive what God's thoughts, what God's um, you know intentions are, and then you proclaim it, declare it. So that is what we, they did, right? Anything else that we can? Anything else that we can? Right. Mm. Right. Right. So we see that uh, prophecy also uh, prophecy has an aspect of um, uh, like speaking forth, and also like uh, foretelling. Right. Speaking forth meaning speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, or singing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So speaking forth the heart and mind of God. But it also involves a futuristic aspect where you are foretelling, right? In sharing or in speaking, I'm sorry, uh, with the heart and mind of God, we know that the Holy Spirit, He is the Spirit of revelation and wisdom, and He reveals things which are yet to come, right? The Lord Jesus, while talking about the ministry of the Holy Spirit, this is what He said, like that He will, He will teach you and He will show you. Um, uh, first of all, about his teaching, and also things to come, things yet to happen. And we see that in 1 Corinthians also, Paul says the same thing, where he says that, you know, I has not seen, ear has not heard, nor have entered into the heart of man, things that God has prepared for those who love him. But the Holy Spirit, he reveals these things to us. <coughs> Excuse me. So, so the Holy Spirit's work is this. So when we uh, prophesy, we do it under the inspiration of God, un under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So they were actually in ministering to the Lord, in worshipping, they were actually prophesying, right? They were speaking forth, they were also foretelling and then all the aspects of prophecy was actually uh, happening, right? <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. <clears throat> 
then we also see that uh, if, if you see that they uh, verse 2 it says that they prophesied according to the order of the king okay they gave thanks and praise to the lord they prophesied according to the order of the king verse 6 all these were under the direction of their father for the music in the house of the lord and then goes on to say what were the instruments right under the direction right for the service of the house of god and it also says verse 6 jeduthun haman asaph were under the authority of the king <clears throat> so we see this whole aspect of being submitted right so they were not like totally wildly independent and saying okay i will this is what i will do i'm not going to listen to anyone i'm not going to be like under the authority of anyone right it was with submission to authority it was there there was this divine order and it was in submission that they did this they prophesied according to the order of the king it says they were under the authority of the king and it also says that they were under the direction so somebody <clears throat> somebody was directing them somebody was instructing somebody was uh, you know maybe saying okay this is how things need to be done so they were listening to and receiving that instruction direction etc right so so this whole aspect of submission okay so we are studying about who are these people who served in david's tabernacle right who are uh, these people who served who worshiped god who ministered unto god and what are the qualities what are the qualifications what are the qualities they had right then we also saw that they they were trained and they were skilled okay so not only were they separated consecrated not only were they yielded not only did they follow divine order um but they were also trained and skilled okay so this is something that we see again that they they trained themselves in whether it was singing or whether it was um you know, the the aspect of ability when it comes to playing an instrument okay look at verse 7 so the number of them with their brethren okay uh, we're looking at first chronicles 25 chapter 25 and verse 7 says so the number of them with their brethren who were instructed in the songs of the lord all who were skillful okay were 288 so 288 were there so they were instructed which means they they received instruction on how to go about things how to do things and they were also skillful so there was this aspect of training in this area of ministry there is this aspect of skill being imparted and sharpening of skill in this area of ministry right another psalm that uh, another place where we again you know see skill being mentioned is uh, i think psalm 33 and verse 3 right versus um, psalm 33 right it says um, rejoice in the lord o you righteous for the praise for praise from the upright is beautiful praise the lord with the harp make melody to him with an instrument of 10 strings verse 3 sing to him a new song play skillfully with the shout of joy okay so here's the psalmist is saying that you know you play skillfully okay so yes we we start with where we are we start with okay whichever place we are in but we don't remain there we grow in our skill right grow in our ability so which means that we receive instruction and receive training and grow in our skill right okay then the last thing we saw was uh, about learning about teaching right we see that uh, um the uh, uh which verse is that under the instruction they cast law uh, yeah verse 8 and they cast lots for their duty the small as well as the great the teacher with the student okay so there was this maybe the next generation you know when we say student it need not necessarily be people who are younger maybe you were people who are older also but who who were interested and who were called and who wanted to be trained right so um 
the teacher and the student, the old and the young. So it was across generations and it was across, you know, capabilities, etc. So they were being taught, they were seeking to be taught, they were seeking to learn. Okay. So this, so we see some characteristics, we see some uh, some some qualifications, uh, etc., for you know the kind of worship that is happening there. And it's interesting, you know, James talks prophesies. Right? James prophesies about Joel, about the tabernacle, and uh, from Joel he quotes, and in this is in Acts chapter fifteen, I think, where he's uh, or fourteen or fifteen, where he talks about. Um, oh, let's just look at that scripture, uh, book of Acts. Okay, and uh, 15, right? Um, he says, uh, and he quotes from um, from Amos, no, sorry, not Joel, Amos, uh, from the book of Amos, and um, Acts 15 and verse 16, and he says, after this, I will return, and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, okay, uh, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins. I will set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. So, so this kind of, this aspect of worship with instruments, prophetic in nature, skilled, uh, you know, in nature, skilled with ability and so on, um, and songs being raised to the Lord, this aspect of worship, and it also happened 24 7. So the Lord is restoring that to the church, which means that the people, who are part of it also need to have these uh, this heart right so that is something that we see okay so when we when we look at um, uh, you know the worship music or the kind of worship that happened in the church well we know that there was worship we know that there was singing um, like how do we how do we know that any scripture that you can that we looked at that you recall you know, in the early church, um, can we say for sure that there was kind of a singing and music, or was it just reading of scripture? What do you think? Any verses that you can refer to? Anything that you can um, point to? Well, we 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 did study it. Right. Um, anything that you can recall? Anyone? <clears throat> no. Okay. Uh, one place that where we can. We can go to, you know, even before the early church. We can say, uh, at the Last Supper, when, when they finished, they sang a hymn and they went out. You know, the scripture very clearly says that they, after they had sung a hymn, they they moved out. They left that they left that upper room. So we see that yes, there was a there was singing, and which was part of their culture, which was part of the act of worship unto God, right? So which was there. The epistles also talk about it. When we look at Ephesians, Ephesians 5 talks about that, right? Ephesians 5, it says, making melody in your heart to the Lord, right? Um, but before that, it says something very important. Um, be filled with the Spirit, right? Be filled with the Spirit, uh, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, right? Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs so different categories or different types of uh, songs actually singing and making melody in your heart to the lord okay, so this is unto the lord we see various kinds of songs psalms hymns spiritual songs making melody in your heart to the lord so so we see that yes this was something that was that was the practice this was something that was that was very much there but be filled with the Spirit. Let it come from that place of um, you know, inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Colossians 3 also talks about something similar. 
there we see the word of God is mentioned, right? Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So we see that, yes, music, worship, the way we have it with music and singing, is very much part of scripture, is very much part of the culture of those times. And we see it's right from biblical times till today, you know, it's applicable and valid, right? So we see that. Okay. So, um, so what are these, uh, when we look at the history of the church, starting with the New Testament church, we see that, okay, this, this is what was followed. And we also saw that the New Testament church primarily were Jews, right? The the Acts chapter two, these were all Jewish people, like right? people who followed Yahweh. They were disciples of the Lord Jesus, one twenty in all, who were sitting, who were waiting, in one accord. In the Acts chapter two says they were continuing in prayer and and in one accord, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And we see that the New Testament church was the early church was born, like birthed right there, and so these were all people of Jewish descent. Okay, so they used to go to the temple, they gathered in synagogues, and they used to gather in the homes also, right? So we see that this kind of worship, worshiping God, what what, did, what happened? Right? In the temple, there was instruction, right? In the synagogues, there was again, a reading of the word. And we can assume that, yes, there was singing because this was part of the, what they did as worship unto God and in the homes also. So in the homes, they were taught the apostles' doctrine. There was breaking of the bread, right? And uh, we know that prayers, there was prayer, uh, intercession, praying for the church, praying for people in ministry, everything happened. So, so all this we see happening in the New Testament early church. Okay. So, but when it specifically comes to songs, Okay. We see three categories mentioned, right? Psalms. So another word for Psalms is, you know, if you recall praise and worship first semester, another word for that is Tehillim, right? The book of book of songs. And Tehillah is a word for praise where your it's a song that you spontaneous song that you bring forth or a song that you sing unto the Lord, Tehillah. So Tehillim is a book, a collection of uh, such songs, right? Uh, psalms. So we see that psalms are mentioned. Then we also sing hymns. Okay, what are hymns? If you, what, where do hymns come? Like hymns again are directed to you know. Uh, we are uh, Christians are not the only uh, people who use that word hymn, but other cultures, other language, I mean, other religions also use it. So a hymn is something that is a song that is addressed to a deity, right? It's a, typically used in an act of worship. So it is a song which is, which is uh, raised up, you know, to God, right? And the church, early church, to the living God. And we had these hymns, right? And when we see hymns, we see that these had elements of doctrine, teaching. Right? It had it had doctrine in it. it either it was salvation by faith, um, salvation through by grace through faith, and uh, you know, so, so it had teaching, it had um, doctrine in it, it had all aspects which pointed people or drew people to Jesus. Right, encourage them in their walk with the Lord, drew people or instructed people, right, and uh, and many times you know after the what we see as the dark ages of the church, we see the Reformation, uh, we see um, um, you know uh, re re the Reformation of the church, reformation of the church in terms of doctrine, right? It was a reformation in terms of church doctrine, church structure also, which came later. So we see that uh, many of the early church fathers, like even Martin Luther, he wrote these hymns. Right? Um, one hymn that I can 
think of or recall is a mighty fortress is our God, right? So he wrote it in German. And um, so this, this is something that he wrote. So these were to encourage the church, encourage the body of believers, and also to instruct the body of believers, right? So these songs were written with, uh, with that in mind, um, theology. It, it was rich in, rich in doctrine, rich in theology. So it was instructing the church. Why the church is coming out of the dark ages, right? They were coming out of the, uh, they were being revived um, to a theology, to the back to the biblical theology of salvation by grace through faith, not a salvation of works, not a salvation through prayer to the saints or you know people who were already dead and gone or you know not a salvation of um, you know substituting god for something else uh, like an idol so it was these songs actually brought in instruction and theology right to the church to the believers right so we see that okay, so we see hymns and hymn writers and right through the ages it's interesting to see the kind of um, hymns and the and the circumstances and the situations through which these hymns were birthed right um one of one of the hymns that we are uh, hymn writers there are several uh, you know hymn writers and hymns so one of the one one of the hymns that we can you know think of is um, uh, amazing grace right amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me so who wrote amazing grace you know, it was a man by name john newton and he was actually uh, if you if you look at his uh, uh, look at his past and so on, he was he was a person who indulged in human trafficking of those days, right? Uh, which means he was indulging in the slave trade. People were taken from the African nation from the coast of Africa. They were literally snatched, taken, enslaved, put into these ships. And under terrible conditions, right? Like cattle, like how you would see, you know, sheep being taken or chicken being taken. You know, on, you, on the morning you see some of these, you know, um, livestock being taken. Literally like that, they were taken and brought, enslaved to America to work on plantations and so on. So they had literally lost their identity, lost their nat nationality, their home, their possessions, everything. And brought to a completely foreign land, and sometimes no idea of language, nothing, and no rights what whatsoever, no civil rights, no freedom, no rights. So it's a very pitiable state. And this man, John Newton, actually was doing that. And he did that for almost a decade, it says, almost for 10 years. This was his life. Ship, go, take, sell people, get money. This was his life. So which means that there was no sense of right and wrong. There's no sense of, you know, I should not be doing this. I should be respecting, you know, uh, human beings. They are my brothers. They are my sisters. No, there was no sense of that, right? So he went about doing this. Then one day, there was a major storm that the ship was facing, right? And everybody said that, yes, this, this storm, people will uh, die. It will sink and so on. And uh, I forget the details, but I think he actually looked to the Lord. He cried out because his parents, his mother especially, was a very pious, devout lady and uh, was quite heartbroken that the son turned out this way. The mother was actually a very devout lady. Um, so he, he actually, at that point, looked to the Lord or called upon or remembered you know, the, whatever his mother taught him and called to the Lord. And uh, they say that from that time on, you know, he was there was a change of heart. So he went back. He left this whole life of slave trading, and he writes this hymn, you know, "Amazing Grace." Right? If you look at the words of the song, um, it says, "Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound," talking about grace that saved a wretch like me. So he he realized his condition. You know his whole condition of how he was dealing with other human beings and literally taking them slaves. So he says, "It saved a wretch like me, 
I once was lost, but I'm found, was blind, but now I see. And John Newton also um, uh, helped in the, um, uh, you know, there was another person, I forget his name. He was actually um, quite an uh, activist in abolish, abolishing the slave trade, right, in, in England, in the UK. So John Newton encouraged him, right? And in one of the, in a, in a movie uh, about this, there is a very, very powerful scene where, uh, oh, I forget his name. Anyway, so he comes to meet John Newton, and John Newton is actually a very old man, right? He's an old man, um, and he he's actually, you know, he's living as a, as a monk, uh, and um, he's uh, sweeping and swabbing the floors, and uh, and this, so this man comes and he talks to him and he asks him, you know, about those uh, uh, old, about those old days and and then he says, you know, I you know what I was I was blind, but now I see. Okay, but the but the thing is, in that scene they portray John Newton as someone who has gone blind physically, right? So uh, he's he's not able to see physically. He's very old. But then he says these words. He says, I was blind, but now I see, which means he was blind to the truth, uh, blind to you know everything that was happening around him. But now he could see. But but physically, he's actually blind. So it's a very powerful scene of uh, realization. And then he says um, he regrets for doing that. He's, he, he, you know, and, but this uh, so this song comes from that place of repentance. And uh, this hymn comes from that place of um, realization and repentance and, and literally valuing grace. Like saying, for 10 years he did this, and then he received repentance and forgiveness. So for him, grace that he received was something so valuable, so precious. And he says, this is amazing, you know, that saved someone like me uh, it was beyond the saving beyond any kind of change but this amazing grace so similarly all of these you know um, if, if you look into the notes you will see a lot of these hymn writers um, and these are from the west right and um, so we see a lot of these hymns which are recorded and uh, there's an uh, recording of it and music notes had been formed by then so we know that okay this is how it sounds the tune of it is sounds because of musical notation and all that even if there is no physical recording of it right um, so uh, we see all these hymn writers John Newton is one of them another hymn writer again is Isaac Watts he wrote songs like when I survey the wondrous cross um, and even, uh, you know, am I a soldier of the cross and, and so, things like that, songs like that, right? Um, Charles Wesley, <clears throat> a Methodist who, who started the Methodist movement, right? he also wrote so many hymns, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing and Hark the Herald Angels sing, you know, which we sing during Christmas time and, um, and can it be that I should gain, right? If you look at some of these words, they are quite um, they are powerful, they are uh, beautiful. Um, like there's a song by uh, Philip uh, P. Bliss, and his song is uh, the, one of the hymns that he has written is "All May Almost Persuaded," right? Um, so it, it's it talks about a person who is on the verge of making a decision for Christ, but he's not made that decision, right? Almost persuaded, you know, somebody like um, I think like Festus or King Agrippa. Right uh, in conversation with Paul, you know, he says, "You almost persuade me to become a, you know, Christian." Right, uh, so almost persuaded. You know, uh, I, I just put the words of that last stanza. Um, let me just put that. I'll put it in the chat and also just read out for our in-person class. Right? Okay, it says this is what it says: almost persuaded, harvest is past. Almost persuaded, doom comes at last. Almost cannot avail. Almost is but to fail. Sad, sad, the bitter wail. Almost, 
but lost. So it's about a person who is there on the verge of making a decision or receiving, but but not you know done that yet. Right. So almost persuaded. Um, okay, let's look at one more uh, hymn, a hymn writer. That is um, Fanny Crosby. You know, it's it's not listed there in the notes, but uh, uh, Fanny Crosby. Um, how many of you know about Fanny Crosby? Have you sung songs about Fanny Crosby? No? Okay. Um, probably if I tell you the name of the hymn, you would know. Um, have you, you, you've sung the song called Blessed Assurance, right? Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Um, that was written by Fanny Crosby. Okay. Uh, so... Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Okay, this is what this is how it goes. Let me just put the uh, just the first verse and uh, and the chorus, right? Um, okay, let me just put it here. Okay, um, is this there? Okay, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste! taste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. So you see, it's very rich in theology, right? I'm born how? Of his spirit, I'm washed by his blood, right? And then the chorus or the refrain, as they call it, this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Uh, I think uh, songs like Ho Teri Stuti, also have this kind of a thought, right? Um, how does the second verse go? Harpal Teri Suti Gati Rahe. Is it? No, it's not Hoti Suti. No, sorry, some other song, I think. No, I think it's Tere Pas Aata Ho Yeshua, right? So Harpal Har Har Din Harpal Teri Suti um, Gati Rahe, right? So something like, you know, the. I want to be singing your song, singing your praise all day long, right? Um, so th this is what she says. Okay, now Fanny Crosby, guess how many songs or hymns she wrote in her lifetime? She lived to be 94, right? She died when she was 94. Uh, guess how many song hymns she would have written? Five thousand. Five thousand was uh, um, Charles Wesley. 5,500. So can you just imagine, okay, 1,000 itself is a big number, right? So she wrote 8,000 odd songs. They don't know the exact number, but definitely 8,000, right? But if you understand her life, then again, it takes on a whole different, you know, perspective, the kind of hymns that she wrote. First of all, she began to lose her eyesight when she was six weeks old. Okay, so they actually did, uh, somebody put something on her eyes, the one who was taking care of her. Uh, that's how the biography goes, that she lost her eyesight. Okay, so, and this was during the time when this Braille system was not there yet. So reading, writing, there was, I don't know how she learned and, you know, uh, uh, I don't know the details of that, but she was blind. She, all through her life, and she wrote these songs, 8,000 songs, and um, very profound. Um, somebody asked her this question, you know, um, see, I know you're blind, and, you know, and uh, don't you feel sad for yourself? Don't you feel sad that you are blind, and you cannot see, and you're going through life like this. And her, you know, her uh, reply to that person was this. She said that, you know, yeah, I know I'm blind, but I know that the first person who I'm going to see is Jesus. So that was the response. You know, the first person that I'm going to see, of course, she didn't have a revelation of whatever healing and all that, um, that could happen here. But this was a response. But just to think that someone who had lived a life like that, um, but with so much of courage and faith, and uh, and also so positive, right, about life. 
so this is what um, and in fact this song blessed assurance uh, uh, another friend of hers she visits a friend and this this friend is sitting at the piano and she plays out a tune right and say you know so fanny just listen to this tune um, what does it say you know what brings to your mind so she listens to this tune and then she says yeah this tune tells me blessed assurance jesus is mine so the first line right and and then she goes on to sit down and write the rest of the song just like that so she was actually a, a gifted poet uh, but she used it in in glorifying the lord in writing songs for the lord right okay so that that's fanny crosby so we see these hymns uh, that quite um, very rich theologically has a lot of teaching of course the language is somewhat old right so we today if we look at it we will struggle right? because there's a lot of the and thou and some of those words which they use which we don't use now right um, so for a contemporary um, you know uh, language it's it a uh, person who's using contemporary language it seems very um, it seems very difficult to use etc understand etc right uh, we say we sing that chorus right we we exalt thee right we don't use thee actually thee means you uh, it's a very respectful and also an old english way of you know uh, but so it's like that it's filled with language like that so it's it's difficult to understand and so on but it is uh, rich nevertheless so therefore we see that uh, um, churches were using it gatherings of people when they in worship they were using hymns right, right from the early church they were using these hymns um and uh, at some point there there was this whole movement where you know the 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 new generation felt that they needed to express these songs in different ways right and uh, and typically we see that uh, in the west again you know in the us there was this whole jesus movement that came out that the, the there was a revival among the hippies like people who were actually uh, their philosophy in life was to use drugs their philosophy in life was uh, you know no boundaries when it came to you know morality right free living right live in a commune uh, grow your own food etc uh used drugs uh, they were also into spirituality eastern meditation and so on so that was the philosophy that was the mindset now there was a great revival among the hippies right so they were not people who were uh who were used to going to church this was a very unchurched generation or unchurched group of people right uh for example they would they would not wear most of them would not wear footwear Right. they not even slippers whatever they would they would they would just prefer it because they it, there was that that was that philosophy you know i'm part of this earth and you know uh, i need to be connected to the earth and etc so they they would they would not wear footwear etc right so some very radical people so from that generation you know came a lot of songs which which was contrary you know to the hymns the style of the hymns Uh, or the language of the hymns so it it it, um, it it was just user friendly just like how you and i would speak right and they were choruses and they were the uh, the music was contemporary in the sense the music that they were used to like they were used to rock and roll they were used to you know a lot of uh, a genre of music that was not traditional in nature um definitely not classical music so it gave birth to a lot of songs which was expressing the heart of man to god and heart of god to people so it was it was sincere but the the kind of music was very different right so so there was a backlash from the the, the from the church like church felt that okay this was satanic music uh, you know you can't because church was still you used to having at the most a church organ at the most this i'm talking about the western church right and um, and wherever the missionaries went like for us in india how did we receive 
God's word. Of course, St. Thomas came here, right? He came and um, to, I think, Malabar, the Kerala, uh, he ministered there, etc. And uh, But we also have had a lot of these missionaries from the West, right? Um, uh, whether it was Baptist missionaries or Presbyterian church missionaries and not in the Northeast and, and others who came with the East India Company, right, when the British colonized, um, well, they came with the intention of spreading the gospel. It was not the agenda of um, the East India Company, right? They came with the, their hearts were pure. They wanted to you know, share the gospel. And then um, in, the, in Bengal, who was it? Uh, sorry? William Carey. Right. So he translated a lot of, you know, uh, uh, into a lot of Indian languages, the Bible into a lot of Indian languages. So the thing is that when that was the kind of worship that they were used to, hymns that, that sung in the church. So they brought that. Right? They brought that in. And a lot of these hymns were also translated or the songs which were in the early church, which was in the style of the hymns, right? uh, which was written for maybe choirs, and uh, you know uh, traditional worship and so on. So, so we see some hymns, some songs like that in the what we would call as a traditional mainline churches, right? Um, so, uh, anybody from okay, even from Catholic backgrounds, you would you would see those you know those kind of singing, right? The language could be the local language, but the kind of songs and the kind of style of singing, the style of music would be that, right? Um, any other church background, Catholic? I come from a CSI background. Anybody from a mainline church kind of a background? Um, apart from this, uh, anyone online? Like a traditional church? Lutheran, no? Sorry? Oh, Prince is from Lutheran. Okay, Prince, see you, your mic is muted, but uh, we are getting responses from here about you. <laughs> from Lutheran background. So so all this, you know, we see all these churches we established in those days came, brought that thing, just like how we see in the in the, in the New Testament church that uh, whatever was followed in the Jewish order of worship, that is what the early believers took. And similarly, this is what was happening. And so they were born again. People were born again. Indians, you know, uh, and different. They were born again, came to the Lord, in the, gathering in churches. Style of worship, there, right? So that's how it started. Right? And then, um, so we see, you know, other songs being written. And um, so the thing is, when it comes to Carnatic music, let's say Indian Carnatic music, classical music, what was it used for? Style of music. Initially, the roots. It was used in sorry. Okay, language. Yeah, Sanskrit. Yeah, so used in worship of deities. That was it. You know, temples, uh, other uh, uh, you know gatherings, but it was used in the worship of deities. But it was a it was a style of music, right? But the church, early church, found it like okay. It, if you sang Carnatic music, it was like, okay, you the whole thing itself is you're addressing the deities. So they, they avoid it completely, right? But that is not so. Music is neutral, right? It's how you use it. Um, but the thing is, the memory is there, right? Because the temples are playing that. Any concert which is in deity of, you know, which is in honor of any of the deities, this is the form of music which is used. So immediate for an Indian, uh, who was who was coming from that kind of a faith background? That would seem very, very, you know, you know, I've already come out of it. I don't want to get back into that. You know, they associate that with the worship, right? So the church actually avoided that for a long time, right? But we know that you know, that need not be, right? And so we have a lot of Carnatic, you know, music now songs in the Carnatic, uh, using Carnatic music, coming out in the churches uh, in, in worship of the Lord, right? Okay, so we'll take a break and then we'll come back. Right.